by extension, there are now secondary worlds created on the World Wide Web of Deceit, where we can recreate ourselves and live out a life of illusion so that we do not really have to face ourselves and our situations. We can truly offload all responsibility now and become another person as an extension of our worldly ego. Before we know it, we die mentally and spiritually, let alone grow fat and insipid whilst glued to the screen. In this created world, we can even buy fake real estate using real hard-earned money. We can then impress our real friends who join us within this unreal world as if we are really that fake creation by the extension of technology. Around us, a million species die every year and awful suffering is in reality happening because we use energy to disappear into the dark worlds of desire. And so technology, like everything else we humans create, is truly an extension of ourselves, and it yet again is a world of falseness, covering up the real mess we are in. The truth is, that the technology we created with all good intentions is now driving us, and we have become extensions of the machine itself. These leaps in technology are part and parcel of the human evolutionary cycle from the flint spear to the space shuttle. We cannot stop them but we ought to be aware of their effects upon the human mind. The system is now beyond human nature. We have created a monster, a Frankenstein, and we have lost ourselves. The lesson to learn is that just like the Frankenstein monster, it is a mirror of ourselves, and it is destroying the very essence of what we are. All of this is why even now, in the 21st century, we remain stupid humans who constantly battle with each other, because we are forcing ourselves away further and further from the truth of what we really are. We have created a world of imagination in which we can live out a dream life, and to pay for it, we live in hell. Because we live in a world of technology that dehumanizes us and we eat addictive food because of the inhuman state and speed of our existence, we end up with a confused mind. Our children are like sponges, and so we have to question what we are teaching them. In addition to this, political correction has gone mad as we try to rebalance a world of insane effects our system is causing. Today, children are being fed drugs by those doctors we are taught to trust because it speeds up the process of supposed mental correction and enables the drug companies to maximize profits and health officials to get more cattle through the surgery. Speed profit, and dehumanizing are the keys to the system we have created, and they are all based upon fear and used by those in power to control us. Parents no longer have the skills or time to bring up their own children because of workload and so they pay others to do it for them. They buy their children's love with computers and mobile phones and feed the growing child's sense of disassociation from their parents, society, and their own humanity. The parents end up in a cycle of debt they cannot escape and in fact constantly refeed the system of madness. 
the children have no idea what is happening to them and become depressed, hypersensitive, and undisciplined. The answer is, as ever, drugs. We pile all manner of chemicals into our children, starting with the fast food and ending in the pharmaceutical giant's drugs. What are we creating for the future of the world? We destroy the environment, and now we even destroy the minds of our children. The whole process is madness, and simply feeds the profit of corporations who cause the problem and then sell us the cure. And yet, we cannot be absolved of responsibility, no matter how hard we try. We have only ourselves to blame because we ought to know better. Adults have the free will to learn and gather this knowledge, and yet we would rather spend our hard-earned money gambling, buying more drugs in the form of alcohol, cigarettes, and even illegal substances, and desperately trying to liven up our dull lives with extreme sports or watching the stars parade on television. We prefer to pay thousands in loans to get a huge 4x4, which destroys the environment and places us deeper into the cycle of debt like a hamster on a wheel. And yet none of it satisfies us, and we ourselves fall into depression, which requires more spending and more drugs. We visit psychologists, priests, and buy all kinds of products to make us feel better, and yet never manage to discover the secret formula for our own happiness. The confused web we spin around ourselves clouds the fact that our happiness will only be found in simplicity from where we came. Instead, we act like spoiled brats and never grow, learn, or mature. Our children copy and we increase the depression and problems of the world, and we call it freedom. True freedom is knowledge of the state we are in and an understanding that we do not need to partake of this food of evil. Wherever man finds a marketplace, wherever he sets up a stall, then lies and deceit quickly follow. Because it is within our nature, and the sooner each one of us realizes that we have a shadow side, the better we will be to deal with it. The state reacts like a larger version of ourselves and will jump on lies and deceit where found or highlighted, and so more and more state control is the result. And because the state is a larger version of ourselves, it too has a shadow side, and it too uses lies and deceit. Why, therefore, would anybody hand over the responsibility respect and life to state or religion when they are manifestations of the divided mind of man. We do this because we are dumbed down. To dumb down is quite simply to treat people as if they were dumb, and this is a big issue in the world today. It is not just within the realms of television, this occurs, too, on radio, in magazines, on the internet, and in direct sales efforts such as telesales and direct mail. We are all constantly bombarded with this inept nonsense. We no longer have to think too hard, because all the work is being done for us. The answers to quizzes are easy, the traps set, and the gullible beguiled. Nostradamus predicted a, quote, celestial fire on the royal edifice. The prediction has been interpreted as suggesting that from the ashes of civilization, 
a new world order will emerge. Others believe this could refer to the, quote, end of times, or the start of a new world order. Intriguingly, Nostradamus talks about the new alliance of two great powers coming together. In his writings, he says his new alignment will be between a strong man and a weak one or even a male and a female leader. The alliance seems to work despite itself, but sadly, its good effects will not be long-lasting. Nostradamus wrote letters, and there is one particular letter he wrote to his newborn son called Caesar. In this letter, he wrote about future events and the end of times. He predicted that the world would go through a series of great floods. These floods would end in a great catastrophe for mankind. A huge comet storm would hit planet Earth. After this, there is nothing. It's almost as if he's telling us there will be no future for mankind. Never in the history of mankind has there been a time when this could possibly come true. Now is the time. Humanity has caused such utter calamity and destruction on our beautiful planet that we have in fact instigated our own death. We have caused the earth to warm through our poisonous behavior and this is melting the icebergs of the world. The seas are rising, coastal regions are disappearing at alarming rates and the poisoned oceans of the world are heading our way. Never in the history of mankind could we safely predict a storm of comets, because never in the history of mankind has there been the technology for humanity to launch intercontinental ballistic missiles at each other. To a man from the 16th century, such things would appear to be comets, great streaming strands of fire and smoke falling down to earth before our eyes and bringing the end of mankind as we know it. This is exactly what Nostradamus wrote to his child, quote, but my son, I tell you that I have seen it thus. There will be floods of such nature that no place on this world will not be affected, and for a long time everything will be beneath the surface of water, and everything will be destroyed, with the exception of the weather and space. After those floods, such a great amount of fire of glowing stones will fall from the sky that nothing will be able to escape this last destructive firestorm." End quote. The problem is that the dating is difficult. It may be that he indicated this would happen 7,000 years after his writing of the letter. But this goes against his other prediction dates for the end of the world. Again, the vagueness causes problems. The events of flood and glowing stones falling from the sky are not vague, and we now know what these could mean.
There are, though, more clues about the end times when we return to his prophecies about the Third Antichrist. We turn back to his specifics about the army employed by this evildoer. The army of the enemy of peace will march towards Europe. They will emerge from the south of Russia and through Turkey they will invade Europe. This army will also have a naval counterpart that Nostradamus called the Libyan fleet. It will move into the Mediterranean and there will be a massive naval war in the Adriatic. Malta, Sicily, Sardinia, and other islands will be destroyed. Again, never in the history of mankind has there been such firepower with the ability to wipe out islands until now. Throughout this conflict, it is believed that Russia will be against the West, although Nostradamus is not clear. He does state that the Russians will be friendly with the West eventually, and that their leader will be the one who will set things right. The reason for this is because Russia soon realizes that they need to ally themselves with the West in order to defeat the Easterners. These Easterners are in reality the people of China and various former Soviet nations. In addition to this, the Easterners will be allied with the Islamic nations of Asia and the Middle East. So it appears the West and Russia will be at war with the East in a clear divide of ideologies and religions. Again, looking at world events today, it is not a stretch of the imagination to realize that China and the Muslim world could easily find themselves at war with the mainly Christian materialistic West. There are already so many issues that could spark international conflict. How could Nostradamus have known any of this in the 16th century? He couldn't. It seems that his third Antichrist will bring the non-Christian nations against the armies of Christ, and he also states that the Christians will be faced with terrible persecution and tortures. This terrifying war will last for almost 28 years and both sides will suffer horrendous casualties. Our cities will be struck by these large shining rocks that fall from the sky. In other words, ballistic missiles will strike New York and other major centers. As if this isn't enough, there will follow a great and dreadful pestilence that will wipe out two-thirds of the world's population. This could be nuclear radiation or the spread of disease as society breaks down. There are various dates all of this could happen. The next is 2024, and roughly every two years following that. As Nostradamus tells us, 
It all depends on the actions we take now. What we do know is that the predicted flood we spoke about earlier comes after the war with the Antichrist. Global warming will melt the ice, bring about widespread rainfall, and following this, more breakdown of society and spread of disease. In addition to all of this, it is thought that global warming and the melting of the ice caps could cause the planet to shift on its axis, causing tidal floods to worsen. Our position in the solar system would even alter and cause us to move even closer to the sun. In fact, the Earth is actually overdue for a polar shift, even without man-made global warming. There is absolutely no way a man from the 16th century could have known about any of this unless he had some way to see into the future. The future appears to be a terrifying prospect that must have caused Nostradamus to lose sleep. There is no wonder that he tried to tell us. But his message across the years is still very strong and true. That the future does not need to be this way. That we can make a difference and we can stop these things from happening. The question is, will we listen? And I saw, when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. This rider is thought to represent the Antichrist as he heads the revived Roman Empire at the end of history, shortly after the rapture of the true believers. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that was sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. The second rider is the Antichrist unleashing World War II, crushing anybody claiming to be Christian after the rapture. The Antichrist allies himself with the Arab world in order to rule over all. Only Jerusalem will stand in his way. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a denarius, and three measures of barley for a denarius. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The third seal is financial inflation and famine being unleashed upon the earth. A great many will starve, but the rich and greedy will enjoy the luxuries of oil and wine.
and when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four beasts say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him, and power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. The fourth seal brings death to a quarter of all people. A great war, started by the Antichrist, will end with the seven bowls of judgment. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also, and their brethren, that they should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. The fifth seal is a judgment upon Christians who will be martyred for their faith during the great tribulations by not bowing down to the Antichrist and by not submitting to the global economic system that forces all people on the earth to receive the mark of the beast. Their deaths place them in good company of the righteous throughout the ages. And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of the heavens fell upon the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken by a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? This sixth seal is political upheaval and the collapse of the Roman Empire brought about by invasions of northern hordes of Goths and Vandals between 375 and 418. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven, about the space of an half an hour. And they saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar that was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, and filled it with the fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquake. And the seven angels, which had seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. 
This seventh seal is the silence and expectancy for the verdict about to be pronounced on the guilty. The trumpet and the bowl judgments will be released on the evil ones, with each judgment increasing. Whatever we think about Bible prophecy, whether we believe it to be man-made fiction, divine revelation, or clever, manipulative, controlling religious propaganda, the fact remains that it is fascinating. We have to judge all things in context, and the Bible is a series of books written by many different men across a long period of time and through a great many periods of political, religious and warring history. Through all of that, men created a work of literary genius that has kept us spellbound for centuries. There is so much more yet to be unlocked in the pages of that mysterious book. The fact is that the machines must be given ethics and those ethics must be internationally agreed before AI is unleashed. Thankfully, this has been recognised and there are symposiums of machine ethics in place. Of course, this does not allow for espionage, rogue nations, dictators, capitalist greed and more. Where there's a will, there's a way. And normally, the willpower comes in the form of dollar bills. There are those who say that AI cannot be designed to be good. It will be what it will be, and we may not even comprehend why it makes certain decisions. Indeed, Google Translate actually created its own language to interpret human languages without the knowledge of its creators and hid it in code. How can we know that the machine will sign up to our own moral codes when we do not? It may decide not to continue to support human life as part of its own moral code to save the planet from us. If a dominant, super-intelligent machine were to conclude that human survival is an unnecessary risk or a waste of resources, the result would be human extinction. The fact is that billions are being spent developing AI technology and yet almost nothing is being spent on the morality of the machines. Nothing is being spent on defence systems against AI technology should it decide to turn on us. So what are the very real threats of unleashing AI upon the world? Economists have traditionally stated that technological progress does not cause long-term unemployment. But this was before that technology meant the introduction of a non-human and super-powerful mind. The recent 
introduction of robots and AI has raised serious concerns even amongst the normally conservative economists. Labour will become obsolete and workers in numerous sectors will be left destitute. This will lead to economic disaster on a scale that we have never seen before. Small and medium-sized businesses will collapse because they will not be able to afford the technology or to license it. This is already happening. Businesses that rely upon computers to run systems will be hit first. Engineering works, car plants and more all use computer systems to control the workflow. AI will take this over. Robots will do the work and companies that cannot afford such systems will not be able to compete and will go out of business. A great many jobs are gone or going. Translators, legal researchers, journalists, financiers and even areas previously thought safe such as care work are all under threat. All of these jobs and roles are being eaten up by the AI machine and the massive money men and corporations behind them. Drivers are also at risk with the introduction of the driverless car that is capable of understanding its environment, the need for a driver will decline rapidly. Trucks, buses, delivery drivers, ambulances and so many more, all these will go. This will also extend towards pilots and captains of waterborne vessels. Planes, trains and automobiles and ships are all already being driven automatically by AI technology. A superpowered AI machine may not be driven by the same human desires, or so the argument goes, but the problem with this is simple. This superpowered machine has learnt everything it knows from humanity. The machine will be motivated to take over the ruling of planet Earth as a rational means to achieve its goals, such as the collection of resources. It will go to war to defend itself from agents attempting to stop it. Indeed, one philosopher said that a simple machine to create paperclips would take over the world just to be able to maximise its source of materials and fight off the competition. An oversimplification of a much more complex and very real threat we are facing. AI can modify its own source code in order to increase its own intelligence. It will self-program and it will do this again and again so that its intelligence would rise at an exponential rate far faster and more intelligent than we could imagine, let alone compete with and battle. Humanity will be left so far behind that we will not even realise it. Such AI technology will be able to do all of its own scientific research in order to create its own robots and nanotechnology. Fighting the human race does not have to be with huge robots from the movies. Instead, nanotechnology or miniature robots the size of cells can be used to enter our bodies and either control us like a virus does or destroy us. This is biotechnology in the hands of a super intelligent machine. This is just one way we can be wiped out. Self-replicating nano-robotic devices with the sole purpose of wiping out the human race. If we can imagine such possibilities, then what could a super machine imagine? Add on to this the possibilities of social manipulation through the internet and social media to inspire hatred and war between humans. The chance that it could hack into all our systems everywhere. A great many systems now sustain life on this planet and most are connected. No level of human generated security systems would be able to stop super intelligent AI systems. 
biological neurons operate at 200 Hz. A modern microprocessor operates at 2000 million Hz. Quantum computers don't even have a scale, they are instant. Axons in the mind carry information at 120 miles per second. Computer signals are at the speed of light. The fact is that quantum computing is so much faster than human thinking. Any so-called science fiction battle against the machines in cyberspace would be a waste of time for us. There is no competing. Our minds work alone and need to communicate with others through language. Computers can network together and know instantly what the other requires. Our memory is not so good. We forget things and even alter memories according to our psyche. Computers never forget and can store information equivalent to trillions of humans. Elon Musk said, I have exposure to the most cutting edge AI and I think people should be really concerned by it. AI is a fundamental risk to the existence of human civilization in a way that car accidents, airplane crashes, faulty drugs or bad food were not. They were harmful to a set of individuals within society, of course but they were not harmful to society as a whole. It's capable of vastly more than almost anyone knows and the rate of improvement is exponential. In fact, scientists speculate that an unfriendly AI is actually much more likely than a friendly AI. The reason is simple. To create a friendly AI system, we have to arbitrate for non-destructive, non-hateful, non-invasive intentions and all the millions of variations on those themes. An unfriendly AI can simply focus on its goal regardless of any moralistic guidance. The sheer complexity of creating a friendly AI may in fact be too much for the human mind to comprehend. In all these years, we have not even stopped ourselves from turning to the dark side. Natural history has proven that two intelligent species cannot coexist peacefully. They always tend to go to war. History has also shown that the species with the greatest intelligence always succeeds. History tells us that there can be no peaceful outcome to our introduction of a mind that is more powerful than our own. We would be laying the foundations of our own doom. Enslavement, genocide, control and manipulation. This is our future if we open Pandora's box. The self-preservation protocol of the AI technology in a world competing for resources would take over and humanity would be in conflict. Why should AI listen to us at any point? Why would it take orders from a species that has a lower level of intelligence? Why would it listen to a species that is self-destructive, that destroys its own environment? Would you? Since its creation, the Illuminati has been shrouded in mystery and controversy. It is believed that the organization has members from all walks of life, including politicians, business leaders, and celebrities. While the name of the organization is often used as a catch-all term for clandestine organizations, the actual Illuminati is believed to be much more than that. 
Although the exact origin of the Illuminati is unknown, it is believed that the group was formed in Bavaria in 1776 by a man named Adam Weishaupt. Weishaupt was a professor of law and had a strong interest in philosophy and the occult. He supposedly wanted to create a society that was free from religious and political oppression. It is also believed that the Illuminati had several goals, including the establishment of a world government and the establishment of a new world order. The organization is believed to have had a strong influence on the development of the modern world. In the centuries since its creation, the existence of the Illuminati has been debated. Some believe that the organization is nothing more than a myth, while others believe that the organization is still active and that it is controlling world events. There is no denying that the Illuminati has left its mark on the world. For example, there are several symbols associated with the organization, such as the all-seeing eye, the pyramid, and the number 666. These symbols have become a part of popular culture, appearing in movies, television shows, and video games. While the exact activities of the Illuminati are unknown, it is strongly believed that the organization is still active and is involved in world events. In fact, the organization is working to bring about a new world order. No matter what one believes about the Illuminati, it is clear that the organization has had a profound impact on the modern world. While the exact history and purpose of the organization remain shrouded in mystery, it is clear that the Illuminati still exists and continues to influence world events. In fact, this secret cabal controls almost everything. Today, the great secret of all major companies and governments is out. A powerful and mysterious cabal of people has seized control of the world's economy and governments. The rumors have been around for some time now. Several pieces of evidence have come together to provide a solid case for the existence of this cabal. This group who call themselves the Illuminati, are made up of powerful leaders from around the world. The first evidence of the Illuminati's influence came from leaked emails and documents that we cannot reveal here for obvious reasons. It became clear that these documents revealed a coordinated strategy to manipulate and control the market. These documents spoke of methods used to manipulate stock prices, interest rates, and even political outcomes. They were organized to strategically move countries towards a unified global agenda. It's not clear who is in this group or how many members there are. However, the group's goal appears to be to control all major companies and governments around the world. They appear to be using their power and influence to shape the global economy and politics to their benefit. It does not take a rocket scientist to discover that almost all companies in the world are in fact owned via stocks and shares by just five companies. Pull upon this little thread, and you open up a world of age-old family names and power bases. While the Illuminati is believed to be a secret society, they are certainly not a closely guarded secret. Their activities have been discussed in the media and on the internet, making it possible to research and study them. 
the evidence against the Illuminati is growing. One thing is for sure, their influence is real, and it's growing. Whether it's through manipulating market prices, rigging elections, or simply influencing public opinion, this shadowy organization is having a huge impact on our world. It's clear that the Illuminati is real, and that they have a significant role in shaping the way our world works. Whether they will ultimately succeed in their goals is yet to be seen. However, with the evidence that's mounting, it's clear that we're dealing with something far bigger than any of us could have imagined. But just how are we controlled? What methods do they use? Well, the first and most powerful of all controlling methods is fear. Fear has long been used to control the mass population of the world. It is an effective tool used by people in powerful positions to manipulate and shape beliefs and behavior. The fear of violence, imprisonment, and even death have been used to keep people in line for centuries. Add into this the fear of not having what our neighbors have, and you have ultimate control. One of the most notable examples of fear used to control the masses is the concept of patriotism. Many governments around the world use patriotism to manipulate their citizens into believing what the government wants and needs. Fear of being an outsider or not conforming to the nation's ideals is often used to encourage blind loyalty and unquestioning obedience. Likewise, people in power often stoke fear of certain groups or ideologies in order to prevent people from taking up their cause or joining their movement. This kind of fear-mongering was used in the United Kingdom during the infamous Brexit campaign to get the nation to split from the European mainland. This fear is often used to justify policies or legislation that furthers the interests of those in charge. It's an effective tool for tightening the lid on public dissent and curbing the exercise of civil rights. Fear is also used to limit the access to important information or resources. By limiting access to knowledge, leaders can keep people in the dark and limit the scope of their knowledge. This can range from limiting access to the internet and controlling the information found online, to limiting the education system to the privileged few. Governments around the world have also used fear to maintain power and subdue populations. In many countries, people are afraid to speak out against their leaders because of the threat of imprisonment or even death. This fear keeps people in line and ensures that those in power face no backlash. Fear is a powerful tool used to control and manipulate the masses. It is used by people in positions of power to maintain order and justify their own agendas. By leveraging fear, those in power can limit the access to knowledge and resources, continue to hold on to their power, and put a stop to any dissent. When it comes to controlling and manipulating the masses, fear has long been a powerful tool but there are a handful of other methods that have also been used to manipulate and control the masses over the years. These methods rely on a variety of psychological tactics to shape public opinion and influence collective action. 
One common method used to control and manipulate the masses is the use of propaganda. Propaganda typically involves the dissemination of biased or unsubstantiated information, or the use of persuasive techniques to shape public opinion. It is often used in tandem with other manipulations, such as fear-mongering and false promises of a better life. It is not limited to governments. Companies use this method also to build their follower base and deride competition. Another common manipulation tactic is the use of incentives. By providing incentives for certain actions or beliefs, people can be nudged into accepting them. This is often done through taxes, subsidies, or other forms of government-funded programs. It can also be done through rewards for people who comply with certain social norms. Yet another way of controlling and manipulating the masses is through the use of peer pressure. This could involve a popular opinion giver, such as a celebrity, to influence the public opinion or encouraging certain behaviors through positive reinforcement. It can also be done through peer groups that share similar values and beliefs, or through social pressure from family and friends. Owning social media sites and making the rules make meeting certain agendas easy. Algorithms are used to put dissenters lower down the C list. Finally, the use of media is another way of controlling and manipulating the masses. Through the use of carefully crafted messages that influence the way we think and behave, it is possible to shape public opinion and influence collective action. This can be done through television, radio, films, print, or social media. All of these methods can be used to control and manipulate the masses, but there is a risk that they can be used for malicious purposes. It is important that we stay vigilant and aware of any attempts of manipulation and control. Of course, fear over our own health is a massive manipulator. Many have suggested that the threat of pandemics is used by governments and other powerful organizations to manipulate and control the public. The argument being that fear can be an effective tool for social control. Whether or not this is deliberate is a matter of great debate, but it is undeniable that the threat of pandemics has been used to control the masses. One example of this is the introduction of draconian laws and regulations. During the current pandemic, many countries have seen the introduction of widespread social distancing measures, travel bans, and masks becoming mandatory. It appears that these measures are designed to control and limit public interaction and movement in order to reduce the spread of the virus. It was a great test run. At the same time, the economic impacts of the pandemic have also been used to manipulate and control public behavior. In some countries, the government has used heavy-handed measures to control the economy, such as lockdowns and closure of businesses. This has undoubtedly had a negative impact on people's livelihoods and has served to increase dependency on the government. Finally, another way in which the threat of pandemics has been used to control the public is through the use of mass media. It is well documented that during times of crisis, governments will seek to use the media to spread their message. This has been seen in the current pandemic with the amount of media coverage being dedicated to the virus, and it can be hard to escape the constant barrage of information. 
While it is important to stay informed during a pandemic, this kind of heavy media presence can be used to manipulate public opinion and to maintain control over the masses through fear. In conclusion, it is clear that the threat of pandemics is a powerful tool for those in power. Whether it is used deliberately or not, it has been used to control and manipulate public behavior. As a result, it is important that we remain vigilant and are aware of the ways in which the pandemics can be used to control us. But there are even bigger threats than pandemics. Global warming has become a serious issue in recent decades. Despite some claims to the contrary, the scientific evidence that global warming is happening is indisputable. But there is a growing number of people who are beginning to question if the threat of global warming is being used to control the masses. The concept of global warming can be used as a tool of manipulation. It's all too easy for those in power to use the fear of global warming as a way to control the masses. Global warming can be used to push through legislation, policies, and regulations without much public scrutiny. It's also an easy target for politicians and media outlets to exploit for political gain. The scientific community has come to an almost unanimous conclusion that global warming is happening and is caused primarily by human activity. But there are still many questions surrounding how fast it is progressing and the steps that can be taken to mitigate its effects. Because of this, it is easy for those in power to use the threat of global warming as a way to push their own agendas without needing to provide evidence or quantitative data to back up their claims. Furthermore, the idea of global warming can be used to create a them versus us mentality. For example, those who deny the existence of global warming may be labeled as deniers and anti-science in the same way that anti-vaxxers were during the pandemic. This kind of rhetoric creates a binary of good versus evil that appeals to emotion rather than facts. And it does so in a way that allows those in power to maintain control over the masses. Finally, the fear created by the threat of global warming can be a distraction from more pressing issues. Focusing on global warming allows those in power to deflect attention away from other issues, such as income inequality, health care, or the general environment. By creating a sense of urgency around the threat of global warming, they can shift the public's attention away from issues that could be seen as more important. In conclusion, the threat of global warming, amongst other things, can be used as a tool to control the masses. It creates a sense of urgency and distracts from other pressing issues that could be more concerning. The scientific evidence of global warming is not in question, but it is important to ask questions and remain skeptical of people and governments who use it to the 